Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to the Honest Youth Pastor YouTube channel, the channel that helps believers use biblical discernment in all aspects of life. Today, we're going to be doing that as we walk through um, sort of my uh, my whole takeaway from the Asbury movement, revival, outpouring, I don't know what you want to call it. Now, I want to let you know this is structured, but not structured. Okay. And if just starting from the beginning, just so you know, this is going to be a very long video. There's a few things I want to cover. I do have some notes, which I typically don't do for these videos, but I do have some notes. One, I want to make sure that I cover why I even went, like why even go. Uh, two, I want to talk to talk about the people I spoke to, right? So the people, uh, I spoke to six different sets of people. Well, two, six people all together two people that had been there the entire time, a student and a youth pastor that was assisting in the chapel. So they were there on the ground from the time it started that one Wednesday until now. I spoke to two people that live close uh, to Asbury and had visited. So they kind of understand the surrounding area. And I spoke to two additional people that came in from outside of town. Um, one of them from five hours south and one of them flew in from, I believe it was California. So I wanted to get a wide range of sort of experiences who, you know, from those that were there, from those that were close and those that were far away. And we're going to be talking about their experiences here in a moment. Uh, then I'm going to talk about my experience kind of going there, what I saw. We're going to wrap up with the concerns that I have, as well as the concerns that some other people have, and then end with uh, encouragement if there is any encouragement to have um, in this, which I, I think there is, just to sort of spoil. So uh, the first things first, like, let's get it out of the way. Why even talk about this when everybody is already talking about this? And that is a fair question. And to be honest with you, I am not going to sit here and pretend like I have some new information that you need to know about or that I'm going to like uh, debunk some stuff that you've heard on the internet. Like that's not my goal. I am a very curious, skeptical person just as is. This is just how I am. I want to question everything, figure out things, figure out why things are happening. Um, honestly, I probably, uh, a, a huge part of me probably just believes I should have been a sociologist and went to college for that because I just like love exploring why people do the things they do. So I was just curious. Things like this happen a lot uh, in regards to like large group movements, big things in Christian history, uh, just within America. But most of the time, they're really far away from me. And I was close enough that I could actually take some time and drive to Asbury and spend four and a half, five hours there. And I thought, why not do that? It's that close. Go there and see it yourself. So I figured I'd do that. So a few things. On my drive in, um, I was about 20 minutes out from Asbury and it became very apparent. I went this last Saturday. So at the recording of this video, this is a Monday, Sunday, uh, yesterday, it was packed out with like 20 plus thousand people the day before. I don't know how many people were there, but I was there that Saturday and I can tell you driving in to Asbury about 20 minutes out, uh, I could already tell that I was involved in some <laughs> impromptu caravan going to Asbury. Now, after I arrived, you couldn't find a spot. There was, I mean, I finally found one out by their athletic field, um, but it took a very long time to find a spot and then to eventually walk up to try to figure out where everything was. Now, there was a line when I first got there to get into um, the main hall that was wrapped around a huge part of the campus. It had started back almost where I was parked uh, nearly to the, the fields, and it was wrapped all the way around to get to the front. Now, to be transparent, I had no interest in going into an overflow chapel or to going into the main chapel. That I, I don't care. I didn't care about that at all. What I really wanted to do was talk to people, and luckily some people reached out. So as soon as I got there, I kind of went down into what you've probably seen online, which was in front of the chapel. There's a big grassy area, and by the time I got there Saturday, I don't know when they put this out, but by the time I got there Saturday, there was a huge screen that was broadcasting from inside the chapel, and they had an audio system obviously playing what was there as well. Now, we'll get into a little bit of that in a second, but just so you kind of know how it was set up. Now, there were two people that I, I wanted to talk to for sure. One of them was a student that goes to Asbury University, and the second was a youth pastor that is a youth pastor within Wilmore, Kentucky, and that he had been helping out at Hughes Chapel in a variety of different ways, but the prayer team specifically. And I wanted to talk to both of them for sure because they had been there the whole time. I, I think, and what we're going to see, I think, is there's, there's a lot of things we hear online 
that we just miss out on because we're not talking to people that are necessarily there. Now, again, to be transparent, these are just two people, two people I talk to. So it, it could vary by who you talk to clearly, but these are two people I talk to. So the first one was the student. We talked for probably roughly 20 minutes or so. I'm not actually sure how long, but I got into some of uh, the questions that you guys had asked, and we'll cover those here near the end as far as within the concerns and encouragement area. But the one thing that I really do want to talk about that the takeaway from talking to that student was that there was a few misconceptions about kind of how it had started and sort of um, by the time everybody found out about it, sort of how the kind of the, the, the fever pitch that it had gotten to. So again, just from this student, but there's no reason not to believe this, this individual. Um, chapel ended. Um, I have watched that sermon, by the way. We're not going to talk about it in this video. There'll be a separate sermon review of just that sermon that'll be coming later on. But the sermon ended. And as Everybody does on a Christian campus after you've been to chapel. Everybody goes to class, basically. If you've ever been to a Christian university, you know that chapel services are almost always mandatory. You have to go. You get a few different skips, but most of the time you, you have to be there. So people had gone, people had left, people had went back to class. Apparently, though, 20 people, as you've probably heard, stuck around and were praying. They were praying and singing uh, in response to the message that had just been given in regards to uh, the, the, the posture of their heart and loving people like Jesus loves them. And apparently they, they stayed there for two or three hours praying before anybody really took notice of it. Uh, if, I am, if my recollection is correct, it was at least three to four hours before uh, I believe the student said the president sent out an email uh, to campus wide about something along the lines, isn't it beautiful when students um, humble themselves before the Lord or something along those lines? I, I don't have it verbatim here. I didn't record the conversations. I probably should have, but I didn't. So I'm trying to go from memory here. The point being, it wasn't like a mass return to chapel. It was just this email like, isn't it beautiful when students humble themselves before the Lord? And then people started coming back to the chapel to find out what that was about. Now, the youth pastor that I talked to that's in Wilmore, Kentucky, said that they got a text from one of their students' parents about something happening at the chapel. At this point, people had started coming back to the chapel. And so that, that, that youth pastor went down to see what was going on. Now, by the time that apparently that evening, you had quite a few more people that were coming back that had entered into a time, according to this student and the youth pastor, uh, entered into a time of... Um, really just prayers of sort of repentance, uh, like a really heart posturing of knowing that like we're not, we, we're not where we're supposed to be with the Lord. Um, that was basically the message in a nutshell. Again, we'll cover that in more detail later. But the idea is that like, do you love people the way Jesus loves people? And if you don't, we probably need to repent and, and, and enter into a space where we do and ask God to, uh, to, to, to sanctify us in that manner. And that seems to have been sort of the tone, if I'm understanding the student and the youth pastor correctly, that that first Wednesday night and that Thursday night, there was a tone sort of within the student body of really this repentance of knowing that we haven't approached, um, we haven't approached Jesus the way we should uh, in, in a heart posturing of loving others like he loves us. And the first couple nights were really more of a repentance, sort of a heaviness, and that was reflected in the songs and the prayers, according to, again, the student and the youth pastor. Uh, mainly the student, though, just to, so we are uh, totally clear. Um, now, when you enter into about apparently Friday and Saturday, if I'm understanding correctly, then you start to have uh, songs of joy, songs of praise, prayers of uh, redemption and prayers of freedom. Um, that the students start to sing. Now, again, you, you again have more and more students coming back over these days. Um, but one of the things that really intrigued me was the idea that by the time most of us heard about what was going on at Asbury, according to the student, like a lot had happened before that. Uh, the first videos that probably most of us saw were videos of students jumping and praising and um, doing a lot of the things that we would consider like celebratory um, that you probably saw online. 
But before that, there was a lot of heaviness and repentance. And we saw the sort of the, the other end of that, the coming out of that, the, the praising God that he was faithful to forgive and to, and to posture our, their hearts in a way um, that they had been asking for. Now, apparently also, and this is a very college thing to do, um, those first couple nights, students didn't leave the chapel. They literally brought like blankets and pillows and mattresses in. Uh, and it's 100% a college thing to do where they did that because they didn't want to leave and they wanted to be there, but they also wanted to be comfy. And so that seems to be sort of the sort of the vibe, if I will, of what was going on those first few nights, this real repentance, this heaviness, this not wanting to leave the chapel and be in prayer and being song before the Lord. And then it sort of transfers into Friday and Saturday, that that first Friday and Saturday, um, this celebratory tone. Now, obviously things get uh, you start building after this. This is something we all hear about on the news. This is something you start seeing about online. And then this is where the second set of people that I talked to sort of enter into the picture. Um, They visit the campus uh, after those days. So the beginning of like that Monday, Friday, or that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and that Wednesday, of course, being, uh, I believe that was Valentine's Day or somewhere right, right around there. The idea that you start having people from the community or surrounding the community hearing about this and then showing up. And what we start to see apparently here from, again, my my, my talking to individuals is that you start to see people, um, it, it becomes a lot more about uh, singing and a lot of prayer. And it becomes basically what you've seen online in regards to every day's a little bit different, but by and large, almost all of it is, is prayer uh, and singing and people at the altar repenting. We don't see a lot of uh, reading of the word. Uh, we don't see any sermons. And then you do start to see some of that criticism kind of online about the gospel not being preached. Now, take this for what you will, but both the youth pastor and the student attest to the fact that especially in those first days and from there on, they've heard the gospel proclaimed. Now, a lot of you had reached out and said, well, what, what, what gospel did you know, were they proclaiming? And both of them had DM'd back in reference, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the turning from sin, the death that you will find in sin, and the freedom you find in Christ. Now, again, a lot of people have watched a lot of live streams, have visited Asbury and stayed for eight hours and not heard the gospel uh, presented in that way. But from what I can understand from talking to these individuals, it has been presented there but maybe not in the time that those people were there. And I think I have an answer for that. It may not be a good answer, but it's an answer. Every day um, there seems to be different. So there was the day before I went that Friday, there was a friend that I know that had a friend that went and said that when they went, there was like an hour worth of students getting up and reading scripture. And then there was an hour of singing and then an hour of students getting up and reading scripture and sort of the uh, rinse and repeat of that um, for a very long time, or at least as long as they were there. When I was there that Saturday night in between talking to people, what I saw was about an hour worth of singing, about an hour worth of testimonies, about an hour worth of singing, and then an hour worth of testimonies. When other people had been there days before, what they saw was a lot of singing and a lot of prayer, and they didn't see any Bible reading or a whole lot of testimonies. So what what seems to be, and again, this is, people will argue about the spontaneity of this, this thing, whatever you want to call it, but in general, it seems to be every day's different. It's not really structured, and they're sort of, uh, by their words, letting the Spirit lead them in what they're doing. So there's going to be days where there's a ton of singing. There's going to be days where there's a lot of testimonies. There's going to be days where there's a lot of reading of the word. And and we'll talk about all the minutia of all of that within our concerns and our encouragements here at the end. But I just, I just want to lay that out in front of you. So that, that that was sort of the, the, the sort of the tone, apparently the days, uh, a few days before I went there, um, that was the sort of the eyewitness accounts of, of two of the individuals that lived close to there that had attended. Of course, I was there Saturday. I did not get in the chapel, but I do know two people that got in the chapel at different times of the day um, while they were there. Again, one of them flying from California and the other one driving five hours up from the south to attend. 
Um, both of them had a little bit different of accounts of what was happening. Uh, again, as you probably already know, there was a lot of singing, a lot of prayer uh, in both of all of Saturday, it seems like, along with a lot of testimony, according to both of these individuals. One of them was there most of the morning. One of them was there most of the night. I was sort of there in between. I just missed the first one. I was able to talk to the second one. Um, I did get a message from the first one, but I was able to verbally um, uh, talk to them in person. And that seems to be sort of what happened Saturday. Now, Sunday, a whole bunch of people showed up. And in fact, I think it was Friday Friday evening or Thursday evening, Asbury put out sort of this, this schedule that, that sort of hinted at the, the fact that this thing is going to move off of campus and they're going to sort of put an end to it on campus coming up, which really kind of... Um, fed into this idea that this was a planned thing, right? So the the speculation online, even though it goes against eyewitness accounts, the speculation online says that this was a, this was a planned thing and it was going to go all the way on until the co- collegiate day of prayer. Um, and then it's going to end after that. And the speculation and the rumors online is like this whole thing was planned and look, you know, it was all a gimmick, even though the people I talked to that were there, will clearly testify to the fact that it wasn't planned. It just happened. And then basically what the college seems to be doing is saying like, we can't function as a university with all of these people here. And we still need to function as a university, but we don't want to, we don't want to end whatever God is doing here. So we're going to move it sort of off campus. So there's still a place to worship and a place to praise and all of that can still occur, but we need there to be functionality within our campus right here. Now, you can criticize them all you want. I don't, I don't care. I'm not here to say whether they're right or wrong. I'm just telling you from what I'm understanding from talking to people there, they're trying to move it off campus because what's happening is when you have 20,000 people that aren't normally there on a campus that is normally running college and they're trying to um, you know, teach students a variety of different things, but you have thousands of people outside of your dorm room while you're trying to sleep or thousands of people in your town when there's they're, they're just trying to do business um they're, they're trying to as best as possible accommodate everyone a, a, as best they can now i do want to say one thing before we get into uh the, the concerns which this is probably the concerns part is probably going to be the longest part of this uh whole thing uh, because there's a lot, there's a lot there that we need to look at. But the one thing I want to say before we get into that is that if you've been there, I'm sure you can attest to this. But um, the reality is that the college has to have a good, like they they must have a phenomenal relationship with the local law enforcement and the local churches and just the community in general. Because just from a logistical standpoint, there is no way. They, I mean, the, 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 the law enforcement, the county, the state could have shut this down in a heartbeat if they wanted to, um, just, just because of the sheer amount of people there, uh, the sheer amount of food that's being given out, just the, the, the reality that, that they let it go on for as long as they could before they just had to shut down the road. Cause you can't let that many more people in. They've got to have a great Um, a great relationship with the community. And I just want to kudos to Asbury uh, for that because not a lot of people could attest to that, right? Not a lot of people could put on uh, sort of the spur of the moment, get porta potties in there and figure out uh, law enforcement and do all of these things if they didn't have a good relationship with uh, the local law enforcement and the community. Now, again, people may speculate and say, well, see, it's planned because it it went together so well. But again, talk to the people on the ground. This was something that they were trying to um, work out as things came up. There were a lot of people that were on the altar, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but that were on prayer teams that were, were, they were just ask at the spur of the moment, could you help pray for these people? Because we don't have enough people to do that. And we'll talk, again, we'll talk about that in the concerns, but the reality is the people I talked to on the ground that have been there can attest to the spontaneity of this and God just moving and providing um, what he did. So, I left that night. Um, it was it took forever to get out of Wilmore, but I left with this real sense that there's there's a lot of things, and we'll talk about some of these things in the concerns that I have and the concerns that other people have. But there was this real sense that um, God is doing something there. 
as I said in the tweets that I put out, everybody kind of from the outside wants to label what this thing is. But the people on the inside don't seem to care at all what you call it. They just know God's changing lives. He's changing hearts. He's changing his minds. He's restoring relationships. Uh, he's healing people. We'll talk about that in a minute. I'm sure that's going to freak some people out. But um, th there's something happening there that um, th that is undeniable. Now, we'll talk about it because there are some concerns that people have that I think are really, really legitimate that maybe people on the ground that have been in the middle of it are sort of blinded by because of what every, like what, what the thing that they're in the middle of, right? So, so let's move on to, uh, to that part. So here are some concerns. There are obviously many, if you, um, oh, hold on, before we move on, I'm sorry. This is again, uh, my thoughts are sort of scattered. Two things. Um, I talked about the two people that I talked to, to on the ground, right? Those that had been there since the beginning. I talked about the two people I talked to that live in the area that had visited. And there are also two people that I talked to that had flown in. And I just want to give their perspectives. I got some of their feedback today. Um, one of the individuals very much said that um, you could tell that brothers and sisters were joining together to worship the Lord. Uh, his particular testimony is he drove in uh, for five hour for five hours down. He thought um, that he could just get a hotel room and you know whatever there were some hotel rooms free. Comes to find out he gets later in the night he can't. But he he met somebody um, in, in line to get into the chapel that had offered him a room if he didn't have one. They exchanged numbers. He said I probably won't need to call you. But he gets up and later that night in in actually calls the guy and says, Hey, do you, you know, do you have the room uh, still available? Because I, I don't have a place to stay and I really don't want to drive five hours down back to my house. And the guy uh, providentially, I believe had a room because when he had booked the room that he originally had booked, it was a one bed room. He got to the hotel when he checked in, they said, Hey, we're all out of the one bed. We're going to give you the two bedroom. And so while he's in line, he meets the guy that I know and says, hey, if you need a, if you need a bed because you don't have a hotel room, I've got one if you want one. And that was happening. Uh, and that happened. So my, the guy that I know, my friend, got, a, got to stay that night uh, where he would not have regularly had a bed. But again, I just tell that story because of this generosity that's happening amongst complete strangers. Um, so that's one of the things he really, really uh, talked about. Secondly, uh, there was one thing that he did say that the next morning in that hotel room, they were down talking about, you know, uh, Asbury talking about everything, you know, sort of their, their, all of their separate, where they came from, all of that. And they started praying with one another in the hotel breakfast area. Other people joined in with them praying and they had a prayer time in the hotel breakfast area for a pretty long amount of time. Um, and this is one of the things, I, we're going to get to this in the critiques, we definitely will, but also the encouragements, is that there is something about believers coming together, complete strangers, you don't know each other, but you you know the Lord, and that is what bonds you together. That is the, that is the similarity that despite all the differences you have, you're able to connect on because you've been changed by Christ, and they've been changed by Christ, and you are family. And that's something that's so often missing but what we're seeing here is um, is that. So anyway, one of the other things that we're talking about here, uh, that, that one of the overall thoughts that this particular person gave was that they uh, there was very evident of um, just the Holy Spirit being there. This is something I can't really describe to you, and we'll talk about this in, these, in the encouragements and the, uh, the, the concerns. But there is something about being in a place with other believers, worshiping God, reading the word, hearing testimonies, seeing repentance, um, that is different than any other place, right? It's one of those Christians and brothers thing um, that is incredibly important. Um, anyway, the other person that I talked to um, that happens to be a patron um, had flown in from California to go. And one of the things they said was that, um, and this, this seemed to be attested by a number of different people. Uh, and in fact, I asked, uh, the student that goes there the same question and, and they confirmed it as well. Um, take it or leave it. I don't care. I'm just, I'm just conveying information to you. Uh, but they said that when they entered into the chapel, 
um, there was this di- deep sense of peace and comfort. And um, w- what this person wrote specifically was that they what they saw before them was what they had prayed for for a very long time. This this brokenness and this peace and this humility of their generation to praise God. And they spent a great amount of time just uh, praying before God in tears and thanking him for them being able to see it. Now, again, I get it. There are, we'll get into this now because now we've covered all the different people I've talked to. There are a lot of people that have concerns. I think probably legitimate concerns uh, in some regards about, is this overly emotional? Who was leading worship? Um, there's some other concerns we have here too. Let me, I just want to pull up my notes again. Um, was there repentance? Was the gospel preached? Um, what about the age restrictions? What about some people's particular posts on Twitter? Um, what about, um, some copycat revivals, things like that. So I want to get through, I want to get through all of those. Okay. Now, I think the one thing before we enter into any of these concerns, you have to at least understand what we're talking about here in regards to where this is happening. Whether you like it or not, Asbury University, and then across the street is Asbury Seminary, Asbury, both entities, are part of the Wesleyan Methodist holiness tradition. So there's some things that are just going to come with that that some people aren't going to like. Um, there are, uh, the Wesleyans from the beginning or the Methodists from the beginning, they're both sort of offshoots, but they're essentially the same thing, um, have ordained women. And that is a big deal to a lot of people. I have been very open about the fact that I am a complementarian. I do not agree with that part of uh, Wesleyan Methodism, but you, that's just, that is what it is. Okay. That's where this is happening. So there are going to be certain things that follow along with that. Also within Wesleyan Methodism, you also have, um, especially the holiness movement, this real sort of like charismatic light, right? So it's not full on like, uh, you know, NRA, Pentecostalism, new, you know, apostolic reformation, Pentecostalism, but it is sort of this charismaticism as far as the idea that the spirit still moves and there are certain gifts uh, of the spirit that you'll see. So when I did talk, to specifically the youth pastor and the student, what I heard is that was from the beginning, there were people that some people were speaking in tongues. Some people were giving words of prophecy. Some people were being prayed over and healed. Again, take with that whatever you want to take with that. But the reality is that was what was happening. Now, with that, let me kind of say a secondary thing because some people are going to take that and they're going to just run with it and go crazy. As far as the people that were praying in tongues... The student told me, at least, that when that was happening, there were people that were respectful of other people's beliefs on that, and they would go off into a corner or they would leave the building so as not to distract other people um, from what you know from them speaking in tongues. Now, that wasn't the case every time because I've seen things online where people say that wasn't the case, but I'm just telling you from the student, there are some students, at least, that were doing that, that out of respect for other students of different sort of... Um, backgrounds, they would go off and do that by themselves. Also, as far as the youth pastor gave a number of accounts of people being healed, specifically one of a lady that went to his church that had breast cancer. They prayed over her. When they prayed over her, she felt something change in her chest. She went a couple days later to the doctor and the breast cancer was gone. Okay. Do with that whatever you will. I know there's going to be some people that watch this video that are incredibly skeptical, don't believe that healings can happen, don't believe tongues are a thing. I get it. I totally get it. Um, And so it's one of those things where you just, you at least have to process that because people there, unless you want to call them liars, you have to sort of process through what happened then. Okay. So that apparently was happening. Now, that's sort of the theological the theological tone of Asbury. I mean, that's a very summed up idea of what the theological tone of Asbury is, but it's a Wesleyan Methodist holiness movement. Uh, it's not Calvinistic in any nature. It's very Arminian. And um, so that's sort of the theological background that they're working out of. So just to be clear on that. So let's cover some of the concerns that people had. The first concern, and I've already sort of touched on this, but I feel like it's important to touch on it again, is that one of the questions that kept coming up over and over again is, was the gospel preached? And if it was preached, then how was it preached? Now, again, as I've already stated, this thing's been going on for 
uh, I don't know how many days, almost two weeks. According to the people on the ground that I talked to, once again, the gospel has been preached at various times. Now, some of these times they will admit it has not been done well, right? It's not like you're going to, it's not like it's been communicated in, in a way that I would want it communicated, which is Jesus came, virgin birth, lived a perfect life, died in our place for our sins, rose in defeat of sin and death, um, and, and ascended into heaven and is coming back to judge the living and the dead. And he is the way uh, you can be reconciled to the father, right? So all of those sort of things maybe haven't been said every single time. And I think it's a valid criticism to say that like maybe there should be built into these services a call to repentance in that manner every day, right? So even though obviously it's it's obviously a different sort of setup every day in regards to a lot of singing and then maybe some scripture or maybe a different day, a lot of singing and then some testimonies, like I don't think it would be crazy <laughs> to interject the gospel very clearly at least once a day. Um, I don't, I don't think that's asking too much. But they haven't done that. And I think it is a valid criticism that they haven't done that. I don't think it would be that hard to do. Um, even if it is student-led, whether if it's student-led or not, it doesn't matter. Um, that goes on to the, the second criticism, this, uh, the age restrictions. There was a lot of people online that were very um, upset, perhaps, um, that uh, 25 and under we're getting sort of, uh, let's just say it, preferential treatment. They had a special line. Uh, they were the only ones that were allowed typically on the bottom floor of the main chapel. And then everybody else up top that was 25 and older had to go to the overflow seating. Um, the university, according to the statements that I have seen and talking to, again, the people on the ground there that have been there the whole time, it started as a student... Uh, this is going to sound weird, but it started as a group of students, sort of a student movement of repentance. Um, and then what we sort of saw it become and what was very evident when I talked not only to the youth pastor and the student that was there, but also the people that had been there before from the local area. By the time I got there Saturday and definitely yesterday, it had shifted into something entirely different than it had started as. It seems to me, and this is just my opinion, it seems to me that um, the the movement that's, that the Holy Spirit started in these students' lives of repentance um, and of heaviness of this real reality that our hearts are not in the right place, we're not we're not uh, loving people as Christ loves us, and that real heaviness through sanctification that we need to we need to do that, but we can only do that through the change of our hearts and minds brought on by the Holy Spirit, like that movement that then resulted in really praise and adoration toward Jesus, sort of, I don't want to say got co-opted, but because of so much of it, so much attention that was drawn, uh, because of so much of social media that we all got to see it at the same time, and people start flocking there, um, it, it sort of, it, it shifted. It maybe didn't get co-opted, but it definitely changed. Like it wasn't a, a purely student sort of movement of repentance and praise toward Jesus anymore. Now it was sort of a student movement of praise and repentance where everybody else was sort of glomming onto it. And the university seems to, by my estimation, was trying to, by keeping it 25 and under for certain areas, as best as they could hold on to the purity of that thing that it started as. Um, so this whole age restriction thing, I, I get where people are coming from. They're like, well, if it was real revival, it wouldn't have age restrictions. I get it. I, I, again, I'm not at the university. I don't know their full thought process. They haven't really put it out, but that seems to be, it seems to be that their best intention was to try to keep it a student led, a student focused sort of time of repentance and praise toward Jesus. And then everybody else sort of gets to kind of join in on that. Um, but that seems to be their purpose. Again, the student especially, but also the youth pastor, was it was clear that the university was doing a really good job or as best as a job they could to protect the students um, from just all of the onslaught of visitors, but also to sort of guard them from people that were trying to come in and co-opt what was going on. The youth pastor said specifically, because he he had been helping in the building, that there were a number of well-known worship pastors and well-known Christian artists and well-known Christian church bands that had called and offered to come and lead worship. 
and in the boss move ever uh they said no like you can come and get in line and worship with all of us together as believers but you're not coming and leading this thing and that obvious out of all the criticism that they've got on this i think that is an encouragement that they said no we're not going to make this about you or about uh, your songs we're going to make this about jesus and he's going to be the center of that as much criticism as you want to put on Asbury, and I get it, we're going to talk about a few more here in a minute. Um, it seems to be that their intent, uh, though it sometimes I think may be misguided, and we'll talk about what I mean by that, but their intent is to just to completely focus the event that was happening, whatever God was doing there. They wanted to keep the focus on Jesus. Like if you were coming, they wanted to make it clear that this is about Jesus, about praising Jesus, about what Jesus has done for us, what he has freed us from, what he has freed us un- into. And that seemed to be the purest motive was to keep make, make sure that that was the center of what was going on. <clears throat> so you had a lot of people apparently offer to come down and they told them they could come, but they weren't going to lead music. <clears throat> so... That sort of brings us into, hold on real quick. That sort of brings us into another criticism. Uh, The music that was being played, right? One of the things I saw a lot was people pointing out the Bethel songs, the Hill songs, the Hill song songs, the Elevation songs that were being sung uh, at Asbury during all of this. In fact, I did see a video and I tried to stay away from as many videos as I could, but there was one video that came out that was his plea was like, you know, pick up a hymnal hymnal and sing the old hymns. And I, to be honest with you, I can 100% relate to that. I think the hymns are richer. I think many of them are deeper. I think many of them are more gospel centered. Um, Not all, but a lot. But at the same time, this goes into a, a, t- sort of a criticism and an encouragement for me. What I mean by that is I'm going to sort of use this as a bridge to talk about the testimonies I heard. While I was there, at least the night I was there, again, I can't speak for every night. I can't speak for that morning. I can speak for the five hours, four and a half, five hours that I was there. All the testimonies I heard were centered around Jesus and Jesus freeing people from sin. Now, admittedly, some of these testimonies were incredibly theologically sloppy. There was one testimony that was given by a younger girl that she talked about dying and going to heaven and Jesus talking to her. And I cringed a lot during that one. Um, There were other testimonies that were about, you know, putting faith in Christ and not one's theology. Not that the theology was bad and that knowledge was bad, but if it usurps our faith in Christ, then it can become bad. So I had a huge spectrum of like some very like theologically sloppy testimonies with some very encouraging ones. And, and I, I think that's for me, it, whatever, again, this is just, I'm not authoritative in that. I'm just telling you, giving you information. I think for me, like there are going to be, especially when you're in your college years, some very theologically sloppy things that you do. There's going to be some theologically sloppy songs that you sing that are not like very well put together, but you just don't know that yet. There's going to be some theological sloppy testimonies that you give because you just don't know that yet. Um, There's going to be some things that you say or think or discussions you get in that are not going to be like all buttoned up and orthodox because you just haven't been taught that yet. So the concern of the songs that they were singing, I 100% agree. I think there could have been much better songs picked out, many better songs sung. Um, But I think for what this is, um, it actually leads us into another topic that we really need to talk about. And I can't figure out where to put this anyplace else, so we're just going to put it right here. A great opportunity that we have, or that more specifically um, those at Asbury have and in the surrounding areas have, is this, this, the reality that discipleship has to happen. So let's say for just, just a blanket statement that the salvations that are happening at Asbury, the, um, the repentance that is happening there, let's just say for sake of argument, it is all genuine. Now, if it's all genuine, 
And we are admitting that it's genuine, but there's also some very theologically sloppy things that are being done. That is what the church is for. Like you didn't always have all your theology all up in a row. You didn't know what orthodoxy meant. You didn't know what exegesis meant. You didn't even know how to read your Bible when you first got saved. Somebody just handed it to you and said, go for it, right? And then hopefully, if you were in a healthy church, a good church, you were discipled and mentored and you were taught uh, you know, how to read the Bible well. You were taught hermeneutics. You were ha- taught about culture and context. You were taught about uh, orthodoxy and you know, maybe the Apostles' Creed, maybe the Nicene Creed. You were taught these things um, because someone cared enough about you to disciple you and mentor you in the faith. And I think if anything we see here that we can get, obviously there's plenty of criticisms in regards to the songs. There's plenty of criticism in regards to the Bible not being read enough. There's plenty of criticisms of the gospel not being proclaimed well. Um, There's plenty, there's, there's a lot of criticisms. But I think what we can do, instead of saying, well, I once went to a revival like this and I got saved, but almost everybody but me fell away later. Okay, well, why then? If, if that was you, and I can tell you, I didn't go to a revival and like and get saved. I, I went to a, a student, a Christian student camp and got saved. And I have a similar testimony in regards to a lot of people fell away after uh, a few years of that. But then I think back and go, well, well, why? Much of it was just due to discipleship. Most of it was just due to the fact that you can't just leave people uh, in a state of Jesus saved me. I guess that's it. I mean, a lot of these testimonies that I heard were life-changing testimonies, testimonies of people that had been freed from all sorts of sexual immorality, people that had been saved from all sorts of drug addiction, people that had been saved from all sorts of pride, um, people that had been saved from all sorts of uh, gossip, like all of the sins that you can think of in the Bible that, that, that the epistles point out, right? These people were being saved from them. Uh, they were being freed from them. And that is amazing. But if all we do is criticize it and not go, well, how do we, as a church, disciple these people well, um, what do you expect to happen then for people then to maybe fall away or not fully understand the faith or have a really sloppy theology? Of course, that's going to happen if they're not discipled well. So this whole idea, and I read an article in no shade to this individual, I'm not even going to name him, but that was basically their argument. Like, I got saved at something like this, a lot of people fell away, and therefore it was probably a fake thing. Maybe it was, maybe it's not, maybe Asbury is, maybe it's not, but the reality is that there's, there's something happening in the lives of these individuals. You don't just be freed from sin just out of nowhere unless it's Jesus, And so now let's take these individuals and disciple them. Let's do what we're supposed to do, according to Scripture. Titus 2 is a real good summary of that, where older men, older women, disciple younger men and younger women and bring them up in the faith so that they have resources, so they have a church family. Now, this then gets us into something else. We'll go back to the music thing in a minute because there's a huge thing about LGBTQ plus and all that. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But I want to get into this um, this connected uh, sort of idea here. There's this idea uh, or criticism that um, Asbury is all emotionalism. That it's it's not really people that are being moved by the spirit, but rather it's a bunch of people that are coming together, singing songs, and it's all emotionalism. That I'm not saying that isn't true for some of the people there. By the time I got there Saturday, it was pretty clear that there were people there that were only there for some sort of spiritual experience. There were some people there that I could that I don't know for sure, but just hearing sort of the conversations as I walked along uh, be, behind them or in front of them or throughout the, the throughout the campus, that it seemed to me that they wanted to be healed, and that's why they had come there. And it it really had the same tone that Jesus had with all the people that were following him uh, about, you know, like, you're only here for the miracles. You're not here for me. And it sort of had that tone a little bit on Saturday. I'm not saying it was all that, but admittedly, it seems like there were some people there and probably have been there the whole time that are just there for that. But by and large, I think if you just sweep this all away as emotionalism, I think you're doing a disservice to what was going on 
or what is still apparently going on at Asbury. And let me explain this. So going back to the family aspect, this, this, uh, this family of believers that hopefully many of these students and many of these adults that have been, uh, uh, have heard the gospel, that have repented of their sins, that have turned to Jesus, that have been freed from their sin. Um, hopefully these individuals find local churches, good gospel centered, biblical Jesus preaching churches, and they get plugged in and they get discipled and they become part of a family um, of believers that supports one another and prays with one another and cares for one another. Because I think that there's a huge lack of that. One of the, th- one of the conversations I had with somebody that I know that, um, that, that goes to local church uh, uh, with me is that this, like what I saw at Asbury isn't unique to Asbury. Like on a, I, and I tweeted about this. It, what I saw there is, is just a much larger scale of what I've seen at my local church a lot of times. And what I mean by that is there have been Sunday mornings where the pastor will get up fully expectant to preach a sermon that Sunday and somebody will get up and give a testimony of what God has done in their life that week. And then somebody else will get up and give a testimony of what God has done in their life. And then somebody else, and the whole service is just people getting up, testifying about the goodness of God, what he has done in their life in good times and in bad times. And you have an hour of that, sometimes accompanied with singing. That's not every Sunday, but it has happened a lot. And what I saw at Asbury is essentially a huge version of that. And I think one of the things, maybe not the reason everybody came, I'm sure everybody's motives were different, but I think one of the reasons that so many people went there, at least from what I could sort of just observe, was that they wanted to be in a place where other believers were worshiping God openly and unashamedly. I don't think a lot of people have churches like that. I, I, I The more I talk to people the more clear it becomes to me that not a lot of people have churches where you might go one Sunday morning and you hear a dozen or more testimonies about God's goodness in people's lives. Um, that you go and you, you sing songs of praise to the Lord and that somebody gets blessed and they testify about who God is. Um, or they, they, they go to the altar, and I know everybody's got an issue. Some people have an issue with that, but they go to the altar and then the church I'm talking 150, 200 people gather around them to pray with and for them. I'm talking about a church that gets up and boldly proclaims the gospel. Not everybody has that church. And I think a lot of people are really, really hungry for that. They really, really want that. They're really tired of the shallow five ways for a better marriage, or they're really tired of the, hey, come to the small group where we talk about Enneagram or some nonsense like that. They're tired. They want something real and tangible that God is doing in their life. And for some people, they don't have that. They're willing to travel a long way to get it. And so, yes, I think there is some really valid criticism that comes along with what you kind of see going on at Asbury. This idea that some people are there just for the emotional high of the music. Um, some people are there as pilgrims to you know come and get healed because they've heard of some healings there. Some people are there for the wrong reasons. But I think there are a majority of people that come or came there because they just wanted to experience the body of believers worshiping and praying and repenting together. So yeah, I think we can criticize that a little bit. And there are some concerns for those people, but I think the idea of making sure that these people that are being saved, that have been repent, that are repented, that have turned to Jesus and turned away from their old ways and want to be transformed and be his and serve him and, you know, be part of the kingdom of God. I, I think that we really need to focus on, okay, how do, how do we plug people like that in our community into Bible believing churches to disciple them well? instead of just criticizing the way that they came to Jesus. I I think there's plenty of criticisms. Again, my next point here is I want to talk about, I want to talk about the, the Bible not being read a lot. Um, But before we get to that, I mean, I just think we really need to think about 
how do we disciple all of those people well? Assuming that it's all genuine, assuming that they really want to follow Christ and they have really sloppy baby faith, how do we plug them into local churches that will disciple them well? We have to think about that. Because if all we do is criticize it, they are going to end up just like all the other people that you know that fell, that fell away because they just they had no direction. So there's that. Uh, two more criticisms. Or sorry, three more criticisms. The first one is going to be the lack of Bible reading. The more I thought about this, and here, here's the thing, it's a valid criticism. Music, as far as I can tell, and by the people I talked to, was 90% of what was going on there. Um, the other 5% was testimonies. The other 5% was some Bible reading, but a majority of it was music. And I think that's a valid criticism that the Word of God wasn't proclaimed more and more clearly. I I thought about like what would happen at least this last week, right? If, if somebody got up and they were like, all right, uh, we're going to take a break from singing and we are going to read through the book of first Corinthians. We're just going to read through it. How many people would stick around? Right. And I think this goes to the point of the emotionalism. I I think that would weed out the emotionalism real quick. (laughs) If they just said, look, we're going to take a break from singing. We're going to read through the entire book of James. We're going to just pick. I don't care what book you pick. We're just going to read through it and meditate on it. And then we'll come back to praise and worship via song after that. Like what would happen? I think that would be an interesting, I don't want to say experiment, but I would be interested to see the reaction to that. Because if we're, if, if we're there gathering to praise Jesus, to glorify Christ, to talk about his goodness. Um, There should be no issue with cracking open 1 Thessalonians or James or the Gospel of Matthew or like whatever, just crack it open and read it and let the people of God sit there and listen to the word of God and take that in. And I'm not even saying preach a whole sermon. I'm just saying read through it. Just sit there and read through the whole thing and really just meditate and contemplate on the word of God. How many people would stick around, (laughs) right? Would there still be a line to get in to Hughes Chapel and the Overflow Chapels? Would there still be a line uh, or, or would there still be a crowd out in front on the green watching the screen while the Gospel of Matthew was read all the way through? Would people stay in that line? Would they stay on the green? Would they still want to get into the Overflow Chapels? Because I think that really answers some of the criticism of the emotionalism. If all you're there for is the singing, I think there is a question about um, why, like, what purpose are you there for? Because Christ is just as glorified in the reading as in his, of his word as he is in the songs of praise we give to him. Um, and arguably, and I think convincingly arguably, um, the word of God is uh, a far more, far more rich and far deeper and far better for you than some of the worship music that was probably being sung there. Um, but people in our day and age would much rather sit there and repeat the same lyrics over and over and over again than they would to be able to sit there and listen to the entirety of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew read. That was just a thought I had, but I think that would uh, clarify some things really quick. Uh, Last two things. Uh, We'll talk about the LGBTQ plus uh, uh, worship leaders. And then we'll talk about one other concern about people profiting off of, of Asbury. So I got a thousand different questions about um, were there really, LGBTQ people leading worship in the chapel. Now, the only two references I had to go off of were the youth pastor that I spoke to originally and the student I spoke to originally. And I want to make sure that I I do not get either one of these statements wrong. I want to make sure that I talk, I I give the statement um, from them specifically. So let me find it really fast because I want to make sure I get this right. Um, All right. So this is what the student said. As far as I know, there was only one LGBTQ plus student who has helped lead worship since revival started, and it was within the first couple days. Beyond that person, I really don't know. But I think, as I mentioned before, and talking about when we talked, 
There was also one person who shared a testimony about being delivered from that lifestyle and that had a time of prayer uh, for others that were struggling with gender and sexual issues. Uh, I have been there, and then they talk about they've been there when the gospel was proclaimed. So apparently there was somebody that was up there at some point leading worship, part of the LGBTQ plus um, community, if you want to call it that. Um, there was also a time, though, where there was a public pro, pro, uh, a public statement uh, made, a message given that there, there can be freedom found from same-sex attraction in Jesus' name, and they prayed over people that had same-sex attraction. Um, the other statement uh, from the youth pastor uh, is, is this. Uh, the answer to the question about LGBTQ, uh, an LGBTQ student leading worship would be no. Now, again, I know these are sort of contradictory, but I'm just giving you the information I was given. Uh, I know most of the people who have led worship, as well as uh, the gospel choir director and his best friend, and the people who are directing and finding worship leaders, uh, I know personally. So I would say no, but if there was somebody on stage who was, then I am not aware of it. Uh, and it's not because they are choosing that no LGBTQ plus leaders are on stage, but simply because the worship leaders uh, that we know and trust aren't necessarily a part of that community. Um, so to answer your question from people on the ground, apparently at some point, according to the student, there was apparently according to the youth pastor, if there was somebody up there, they weren't aware of it. So it may be a situation in which the students kind of knew, but the uh, adult leaderships, uh, over some of that was unaware of it. I just want to give you the answers to the question you gave. These are the responses I got. So let's talk about that. What does that mean then? Well, as a lot of the comments stated in one of the posts that I made about that, there was a lot of back and forth. Um, so if somebody just struggles with same-sex attraction, should they not be allowed to lead uh, opposed to somebody that struggles with paying me pornography or somebody that struggles with gossiping or somebody that struggles with self-control. Like where is the line there in which somebody that struggles with it, but submits it to Christ. Um, and I think that's a valid conversation to have. Uh, you can have that down below in the comments if you wish. I am of the opinion that what we have in scripture is the reality that people can be freed from a variety of different sins. That being one of them. Now, is that going to happen? Every single time, is that going to happen immediately? Probably not. I know a lot of people that struggle with alcoholism, but they submit it to Christ and they do not let that overcome them. And their testimony is that Christ is enough and he sustains them. Um, and in that same way, that would be sort of the conversation. Like we have statements being made, but not a lot of clarity given in regards to who is leading and in what posture they were leading. And what I mean by that is it is possible, perhaps, according to these messages that I got from these uh, people that are on the ground, that there were people that were on stage leading that have same-sex attraction, but we have no clarity on whether those people are um, or have submitted that to Christ, that um, they are praying that one day by God's grace, they won't have that attraction. Um, we, we just simply don't know that. And because I don't know that, I, 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 that's basically all I can say um, is that from what I'm understanding, um, there seems to be at least the reality that there was somebody leading from the LGBT plus community. I don't know if they've submitted that to Christ or they fully ingrained that into their identity. I'm not sure about that part. The question that comes from that, though, is does that make the revival null and void? I, I, I don't think so. There have been many people throughout history that, um, that are at enmity with the Lord, that are, that are rebell in rebellion toward him, that he uses um, for his own glory. That doesn't mean they're sinless. That doesn't mean they're even part of the family. But we have examples of wicked kings being used often uh, in order to correct God's people. Um, that's just one example. We have, um, I, I don't know what other to say about that. I don't think it makes the, that whatever was, whatever is happening at, at Asbury null and void. I do think it is a question 
that should make everyone else that does lead worship, that is a pastor, say, okay, how do we handle this situation if it's here? Uh, what is our statement on same-sex attraction? What is our statement on people that struggle with uh, temptation to pornography? What is our statement on people that you know struggle with self-control? Like, are we being even killed about this and addressing it the same way? Uh, but anyway, that t- take that for whatever it is. Um, the last concern that people had before we move on to uh, what I think is encouraging is people profiting from this, um, either clout-wise or monetarily. There was somebody that shared with me earlier, uh, some random person I've never heard of before, um, saying that they were like a part of the Asbury Revival and they were starting one at their church and asking for money uh, in some way connected to that. There was somebody else that shared Todd Bentley, of all people, uh, was bringing something back from Asbury that was going to fuel his future revivals. Um, I think when it comes to this, something that the student said while we were talking is incredibly insightful. So she so, so they said while we were talking that there was a time when they were praying at the altar and somebody came over to give them uh, a, a word of knowledge, a prophecy over their life. Now, again, take that or leave it. I'm just telling you what they told me. And this particular student said that it sounded good at first. Like it seemed like it lined up with a lot of things that they had been praying for. And then it took a real crazy turn real fast. And one of the things that the student said was, I'm really glad that I have been brought up in a Christian home, that I have been discipled well, because I had, I had the discernment enough to realize that this was not a word from God. In the same way, and to connect back to what I said earlier about discipling these students, discipling these people that are being saved and are being repentant, the reason it's so important to, to have Bible-believing, disciple-making churches is so that people can discern by the word and by the spirit inside of them what is of God and what is not of God. There are going to be charlatans, such as Todd Bentley, that try to live off of like the coattails of things like Asbury or other things that happen like it that really get people like up and excited. And it's one of those things where you we have to disciple people well so that they can discern that obviously this man is a charlatan trying to ride the coattails and make money off of something versus discipling them to live a life devoted to Christ, praying that they will have the opportunity to tell other people about who Jesus is, that they will have the words to say, and that they will be able to live by the Spirit's power, the life that they need to live to do the good works that God has uh, predestined them to do. And, but that that only comes... <laughs> by them being plugged in to local churches that disciple them well. There are inevitably going to be people that try to start their own Asbury revivals, try to live off the coattails of that, try to make statements that are untrue, to try to get the same thing started wherever they're at. And we just need to discern well whether those things are of God or are not of God. Now again, maybe you've gotten this far, and you think the whole Asbury thing is bunk, and you you have you you'd say you used your discernment and you declare it not a move of God. Fine. My take as we get into this last sort of section of encouragement is that being there, I don't know if I would call it a revival. I would call it encouraging, though. And and this is why. As I've already stated. This isn't like a unique thing to Asbury. I've experienced it. I'm sure other people have probably in their local church experienced something similar. I think what this seemed to be to me was what it was to begin with, which was a a gift from God to a group of students that the whole world kind of got a glimpse into. Um, it was very reminiscent to me of like a teen camp or even my college days, like I went to Indiana Wesleyan University and there were some, like it just had that tone. Like it took me back to the the the, the worship nights or the revi- revival nights we had at I, IWU when I was there as a sophomore or junior. And it was very reminiscent of that. And what I mean by that is that there was a lot of sloppy theology. There was a lot of people praising God. There were a lot of songs being sung that weren't 100% theologically probably correct. And there's valid criticism to, to be said to all of that. But I think one of the best ways to, to sort of fix that 
isn't necessarily to bang people over the head with how they're wrong and you shouldn't sing those songs, but rather come alongside them and teach them the word, live a life that is worth imitating as you follow Jesus and let that be the witness of convincing them. Let that be the thing that the spirit uses to show them and to demonstrate to them that the theology that they used to have wasn't super solid. In college, I can definitely see that I would have probably been one of the students in the chapel singing and jumping and singing reckless love and having a really sloppy, un, unorganized testimony. But, but praise be to God that he, he put me around people that were able to mold that, were able to teach me solid theology, that were able to, to really um, be like father figures in my life to teach me and slowly walk with me and even when I messed up that were there and being very gracious with me to, to, to get me to a point to where I understood and can look back and say, yeah, that was not the best place to be, but thanks for, for like bringing me to where I am and using that as the crazy doorway to get me here. I, again, take this for what it is. Call me an idiot. Say, I don't have great, I don't, I don't really care. I think that what happened or what is happening and what is, who knows how long it'll go. And Asbury is truly a student sort of movement. What I mean by that is it's, it's, it seems to be God really moving in the hearts of minds of younger individuals, showing them that they are not in the right place, that they have been bound by a number of different sins and that there's only hope in him. Every testimony I heard, even the goofy ones, were about having uh, hope in Christ, the sufficiency of Christ, Christ's ability to take away sins. Like that was every testimony I heard. Now, again, I only heard like 25 or 30 of them. So, again, who knows what the other testimonies were. But when I heard, the testimonies I heard were centered around the supremacy of Christ and the freedom found in him. And so, yeah, some of them were really sloppy. Some of them weren't great. <laughs> some of them weren't super solid. There was a kid that got up that got saved six months ago. He didn't even have the words to communicate what had even happened to him, other than the fact that he knew that he was once bound to a lot of sexual sin, and now he's not. That's the only way he could communicate it. He didn't have the fancy theological words to be able to, to explain all of it. So the encouraging part for me whether you know you, you like it, you don't, you agree, you don't. Uh, my, my goal has been to give you the facts that I've, uh, just the firsthand accounts of the people that were there, the people that visited, the people that flew in, is that everybody that was there, to some degree, agree that there was a move of God that was happening. Who knows what to call it? Who knows how long it'll last? Who knows what fruit will come from it? But the reality is hearts and minds and lives are being transformed in ways that can only be explained by, by, by God, by the Holy Spirit moving in the hearts of minds of individuals. And I think that, that, that got the attention of a lot of people that came for a variety of different reasons. Along with the valid criticisms, I think there should be some very valid encouragement. That encouragement being this that it should show us that there is a very hungry population that wants something tangible, that, that knows there's freedom to be found, but isn't quite sure where that is. But this, this Jesus seems to have it. I mean, the harvest is plentiful, right? So it shows us one thing. People are hungry. Two, it shows us the desperate need for deep, deep biblical truth to be preached and taught. Yeah, a ton of that was sloppy. A ton of the songs that were there were probably terrible theologically. Uh, a lot of that should be talked about. But until they understand like why they're not theologically accurate or why you know what the song says as opposed to what the Bible says, they're not going to get it. And so they're really hungry, but they also need some really good discipleship. So what the encouraging part should be for us is that God is moving in the hearts and minds of, of a lot of people, apparently, at, at least at Asbury, specifically students. 
And that what should encourage us is that, like, is this not what people have prayed for forever? Like, that younger generations would come and have a hunger for Jesus? But it seems to be as soon as that happens, we want to criticize every little part of it. Some of it rightfully so. So criticize it, but come alongside and provide the solution, not just the criticism for it. Be and this is why. If all you do is criticize what is happening, they are going to run into the arms of the very theology that you're saying that they're already there. Do you, do you think that they're going to run like, this is all stupid. Well, I want to talk to you and be part of your church. No. They're going to run into the arms of the uber charismatic uh, new apostolic reformation churches that are waiting with open arms to teach them how to prophesy and to speak in tongues and do all sorts of crazy stuff. That's where they're going to go because all everybody else can do is criticize and not offer discipleship. So the encouraging thing should be is that they're hungry. They're looking for Jesus. They're be they're repenting of their sins and they need Bible believing churches to come alongside of them and walk with them. I'll end with this. If you're a parent, you'll probably understand this. You definitely want to correct your children, right? You don't want them going off and doing a whole bunch of nonsense and playing in the road. But the way to get them not to play in the road isn't to look at them and say, you're an idiot, don't go over there. That's not how you encourage them not to. They may not go in the road, but they, they're going to think they're dumb all the time and that you hate them because you told them that. When you criticize every little thing they do, a loving and good parent says like, listen, like, hey, come here. I don't want you to go over there because that's dangerous over there. You see that car? That car just, if you were in the road, you'd be gone right now. So stay away from the road because it's not safe for you. Over here, you can run free and play and have a great time explaining the why is incredibly important. Loving them through the questions and the discipleship is incredibly important. They're not always going to get it right. They're not always going to get it. It's not going to be neat and awesome all the time. It's going to be sloppy and messy, but that's why the church is a family. That's why we're here to pray with one another and weep with one another and celebrate with one another and be there for one another. So yes, criticize the bad things, but explain why they're bad. I 100% agree that there should probably be more Bible reading at what is happening at Asbury. There are definitely songs that I think probably are not the right songs to be singing um, because they're theologically terrible. There's a lot of things we can criticize and a lot of questions that I think are valid. But the encouragement from this is simply this. People are hungry. They're looking for Jesus. They're turning to him. What happens after that? Where do they go? So that's my takeaway for what it's worth. If you're interested, tomorrow night during the Tuesday night live stream, we will be talking about this more thoroughly between me, Josh, Matt, and maybe some other people. If you're interested in a fuller sort of back and forth conversation, that will be happening then. But if you found this video helpful, make sure you like it, share it, and comment. And I'll talk to you later.